You know, for the past few weeks, we have been in the book of Acts, and we've been talking about a number of things. The first thing that we said is this, Jesus changes everything. Amen? If that's true, you say that with me. Jesus changes everything. Did he change everything for you? He changed everything for me. And we saw how he, he, he changed uh, Saul, this angry, hateful man who was a murderer, into one of the greatest men of God who ever lived. Then we, we, we said this, that God gives us friends to encourage us. He gives us friends to encourage us. Leo, are you glad that you have friends? What? Don't say you don't have any friends. Don't say that. I am so glad that I have friends to encourage me. Listen to me. Christian friends to encourage me. Now, don't tell me wrong. It's good for us to have friends in the world. You should. You need to be a witness for Christ. Uh, but listen to me. You need Christian friends because worldly friends aren't going to give you the right advice. Worldly friends aren't going to pray for you. Worldly friends are going to lead you into areas of temptation. You see, our relationships have to be this way. That Christian friends is where we gain our strength from, we gain our advice from, we gain our prayer from. Worldly friends are the ones we give the gospel to, we love with the love of Christ. Amen? Don't get the two confused. We don't gain strength from the world. We gain strength from the body. Amen? But we give to the world. Amen? Just want for us to have that straight in our hearts. And Drew, you can put up that first slide. And then last week... Man, I'll tell you, Pastor Cody, what an amazing message he gave last week. Wasn't that incredible? About being the example of Christ and of love and of faith and how we need to live that example. And today we're going to sort of be picking up on that idea as, as we're going to see, as we're going on in the book of Acts, we're going to see now, right now, Peter and, and God does something monumental that changes the world. And we're going to see it today. And it changes the church forever. And this is what we want to say. We want to say this first and foremost. God wants for everyone, say everyone, to know Jesus. Would you say it with me? God wants for everyone to know Jesus. If you are under 10 years old, I want you to say it with me. Ready? God wants... For everyone, why am I speaking to myself when I see a few people under 10 years old here? To know Jesus, amen? It's important that our Father in heaven wants for people to know Jesus. And we need to be that witness of Christ. We've talked about it many times, and we're going to see how God did something amazing today. But before we move on, I, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, being a witness. And, and maybe in my own life, some things that have helped me to share Christ with other people. And, and not, not so much from the pulpit, not so much as a professional, but as a person with people around me. And you know, if, if you're going to be a witness for Christ, one of the first things you want to realize is you need to know what Christ did for you. Now, don't take me wrong. We need to know the Bible. We need to know our theology. That's important. But you have to be able to voice what Jesus did for you. What did he do for you? Wow, Jesus on that cross, you took my punishment. I've come to realize what a sinner I am. How about you? I'm not a good person at heart. I may have good thoughts and I can do nice things, but you know, I'm grateful that Jesus had mercy on that cross. He took my punishment so I didn't have to be punished. You know, on that cross, he also made it possible when he rose again for me to have a new life and a new relationship with God the Father. He gave me a future and a hope that I will live eternity with him. And someday when I go to heaven, I'm going to be like him. That's what Jesus did for me. He took away my guilt. He took away my shame. And he took away my pain. Maybe you're feeling guilty. Maybe some of our younger people are feeling guilty today. Maybe something that you've done or something that you thought, you know, all you need to do is say, Jesus, please forgive me. And how many people know he forgives you? Now, if Jesus forgave you, who are you not to forgive yourself? Amen? So we need to know what Jesus did for us. Another thing that's helped been helpful for me, um, and, and I'm going to switch these around, this third one here, know who you are. Now, there's a reason for that. We're going to see today that God may have you sometimes in the most unlikely of places speaking to the most unlikely of people. 
We recently got involved with a, a, a vigil over the, uh, the, 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 the killing of George Floyd, and, and Lee Roussan uh, did this incredible message, and almost nobody there knew Jesus. There were Muslims, and there were Jewish people there, and there, there were other people who were angry, and they had protest signs, yet Lee knew who he was, the man of God that he was, and he stood up, and he shared this message that changed lives that day. See, when you know who you are, you don't have to worry about the world changing you. You'll change the world. Because when you know who you are, you know who you are and whose you are. Amen? See, many times we're afraid of people witnessing to certain people because they may rub off on us. Listen, if you know who you are, the world doesn't have to rub off on you. Amen? You know, uh, we have to be able to know the difference between the sacred and the secular. Now, I, I want to tread lightly on this, and I, I want, but I'm just making a point with what I want to say. You know, when we first got back to doing services again, we said, well, we couldn't get in the building. We didn't have enough people. Yet we wanted to bring people together. We said, let's do a drive-in church. How many people enjoyed the drive-in church? It was sort of fun, wasn't it? You know? But you know, I actually had a few people said, if it's going to be out in the parking lot, that's not really church. I'm not coming. Oh, I'm sorry. And then, then I just tried to find that in the Bible. Where did God prohibit us from getting in a driveway and praising Him? Now, as far as I know, the early church worshipped in graves and in caves. They worshipped in the craziest of places because they couldn't worship in the temple. They couldn't worship in a sanctuary. You see, church is wherever the people of God are, and they're worshipping the Lord. Amen? Some people feel if it's not in a sanctuary, somehow or another, there's something wrong with it. We need to separate the sacred from the secular. This is a wonderful tradition. This is a wonderful place, and I pray that it stands until Jesus comes again. But listen to me. This is not the church. This is the church. Amen? There are so many things that we've put structures in our mind that are secular things that, yeah, they're good in that day we live in and they support the gospel, but they're not the gospel. And we're going to see that today. And the last thing that I want to share with you guys, know what God has called you to do. Now, you may not have like, uh, you may not be called to be an evangelist or a great Christian, say, I don't know what, and a lot of people struggle with that. But one thing I do know, Matthew 28, 19 says this, go into all the world and you will be my witnesses. Amen? He's called us all to be witnesses. Martos is a martos is one who's seen with her own eyes. Remember we said, know what Jesus did for you. Just tell people what Jesus did for you. Amen? You see, it's important for us to know what God has called us to do and to do it. And we're going to see today that God is going to call someone to do something that no one has ever done. That most Jewish people of the time of Peter would say, oh, yeah, no way. Yet God called him to do something. And you know, he called him to do something fresh, and he called him to do something new. And you know, I, I pray that we get back to, to, to a full house in our church again. And, but I don't know what the future is going to bring. Anyone hear what I'm saying right now? But all I know is that in every generation, with every situation, through every trial, through every tribulation, God will always make a way for the church to be a witness and a light of Jesus Christ. And at this juncture, this message is so important because we need to be open. God, what is it that you want to do in Mountaintop Church? What is it you want to do in me to be the witness of Christ right now in this incredible age of offense? And Drew, you can uh, change that slide if you would. Just give me one moment, everyone. I'm just going to see if something works or if it doesn't work. Here we go. So as we get going this morning, get started. Uh, you saw there, in fact, you could switch back for one more second, Drew, I'm so sorry. You know, what we all need in our life is a compass. Everyone see that compass up there? What does, is Curtis there today? No? Hey, Curtis, what does a compass do? Do you know what a compass does? You got one in your backpack, that's great. Do you use it? <laughs> cool. So a compass, if we're out somewhere, especially where there's no directions, if you get a compass, it will always show you where the north is. It'll always show you true north, and then you can find your way, right? 
You see, if we're going to be witnesses for Christ, we're going to live for Christ, we need to be a people in this day and age who have a compass. Not a list of rules and regulations, but a spiritual compass inside of us of what is God, what is holy, what is right, and what is good, what is of Christ, and what is of Antichrist. We need to have a compass. And I pray today as we go through this message, you begin to gain a compass for your life and that that compass is something that serves you so you can serve Christ. Amen? And so as we, as we move on now, and sorry about that, Drew, we're going to see the first thing if we're going to have that kind of compass and we're going to be effective in reaching the lost, the first thing that we're going to see is we need to be people of prayer. Now, I, I know we say we, need, we, we talk about it, but the question is, are we doing it? Are we doing it? I want you to see the scripture for a moment. Now, what we're going to see here as, as we get started is that God is going to speak to Peter about a man who is a very unlikely man. He is a Roman centurion. That means he is a Roman soldier who's in charge of another hundred soldiers underneath him. And this says the centurion that he's, he's a righteous man and he's a devout man. That means he's righteous. It means he does good things for others and he's devout, meaning he, he loves God. And he prays. And while this Roman soldier is praying and, and it says he was fasting, God spoke to him and said, I want you to go. There's a man named Peter that I want to have talk to you. See, while Cornelius, that's his name. When I think of Cornelius, anyone who's over 40 would say, Planet of the Apes, right? <laughs> right? But, um, but Cornelius, he says, I want to do something for you. Now, this is really neat. It says he's devout. He loves God. He loves God's people. He, does, he prays to God. He does things for God. But you know something? Listen to me. He doesn't know Christ. He doesn't know Christ. This is a good man whose soul God wants to save, but he doesn't know Christ, and he wants to send one of his people to him to let him know who Jesus is. See, that's important for us to know, because how about you? I know some people in the world who are really good people. They're really kind people. They care about people. Some of them even have religious thoughts about God, but I know they're lost because how good I am does not gauge my merit to heaven, but it's about me knowing and receiving the work of Christ on the cross. Amen? And guess what? For both the good and the bad, God wants to save their soul, and he wants to use us. Jesus did the work of redemption on the cross, and now he's given the word of redemption to you and to me to share to others. Do you own it? Christ has commanded us to do it. Do you own it in your life? And Peter, it says here, he went up to the housetop at the sixth hour, that's about noontime, to pray. But he became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he falls into a trance. Now, this is important. It says he goes up to pray at noontime. Now, how many people know the Jews would pray three times a day? You'll see this in the book of Daniel. They'd go at nine in the morning. They'd go at noontime and pray. And three in the afternoon, they would stop and they would pray. See, this was not some special prayer that Paul prayed when, or Peter prayed when there was trouble or needed God to do something. Prayer was a part of Peter's life on a regular basis. He came to the throne room of God three times a day. And as he comes to that throne room, he's ready for God to move in his life. Now, there's something else that's there that really, really spoke to me uh, because of who I am. It says he was hungry. Now, I, I told you right now, uh, I, 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 I feel hungry after about 15 minutes. How about you, right? He was hungry. Why would he be hungry? Probably because he was fasting and praying. And after his prayer time, he was probably going to break the fast. But what happens while he's fasting and praying, God does something. He's going to give him a vision. He puts him in a trance. God's going to move. Listen, no prayer, no power. Some prayer, some power. A lot of prayer, a lot of power. You may be a great person. You may love Jesus Christ. But if you live a prayerless life, you're going to have a powerless life. You hear what I just said? That's how it works. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't make it up. You know that, right? I'm not smart enough, all right? You see, we need to live these lives of prayer, and that's what Peter does. He comes to God in prayer. You can change that slide, Drew. And the next thing is, while he's in prayer, God reveals something to him. And I want to point this out for a minute before we read this. When you pray, do you ask God to reveal things to you? Because listen to me, he's a God of revelation. 
Now, I'm not talking about the last book in the Bible right now. That's a revelation. But he's the God who reveals things to us. He says of Abraham, he says Abraham was a friend of God. Abraham came to God all the time. And you know when God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he, he came as a trinity. He says, shall we keep from Abraham what we are going to do? If you are in touch with God, if you seek God, God is not going to keep you in the dark. He's going to reveal things to you. Maybe right now you're going through something in your family. You don't understand maybe what the situation is. Ask God to reveal it to you. Maybe there's something in your heart that you don't understand. Ask God to reveal it to you. If you ask God to reveal it, he will give you the wisdom. Amen? If any of us lacks wisdom, ask and God will give liberally. And this is what happens. He saw the sky open up and an object like a great sheet coming down. Silly posturepedic. <laughs> Lowered by four corners to the ground. So it's sort of like a net, right? And in it were all kinds of four-footed animals, creeping creatures of the earth and birds of the air. And a voice came to him and said, Peter, kill and eat. Yikes! So get this big net. It's got, it's got like, okay, it's got a few chickens in it. They can eat chickens. And it's probably got a cow in it. It's probably a big net from heaven, you know. So it's probably got a cow in it, and he can eat a cow. That's not a problem, you know. And it, I'm sure it's got other things in it that he can eat. But then all of a sudden, there's snakes, and there's like pigs, and other things that God says, you shouldn't eat it. And Peter goes, wait a minute. God, this is stuff that you don't want for us to eat. You told us in, your, in, in Leviticus, you don't want us to eat this. What's God doing? See, God is doing something new right now. Before we go on, I want to talk about how God reveals himself. One of the ways he revealed himself to his people as of old was that he gave what was called the law. Anyone ever heard of the law? Talk about the law. Right? The law. Now, you have to understand what the law, the law to the Jewish people came in two ways. We have the moral law that he gave to Moses. That is what the Ten Commandments, right? Thou shalt not steal, that shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt uh, honor thy father and thy mother, right? And, and all of those, thou shalt not covet what your neighbor has, those are non-negotiable from the character of God. Amen? They never change. But then he gave to his people something else called the ceremonial law. Anyone heard of the ceremonial law? And the ceremonial law was certain foods they could eat, certain foods they couldn't eat. And the way they would have to cleanse and clean themselves. And, and, and the offerings that they'd have to make to God for their sin. And that ceremonial law, the Bible tells us in the book of Galatians and the book of Corinthians, that that ceremonial law was a picture of someone who would come and fulfill all those things. So instead of us making a sacrifice, one would come and make the ultimate sacrifice. Instead of us having to cleanse our home, there'd be one who would come and cleanse our home for us. You see, they were shadows of the real thing, Jesus. And when Jesus came, that ceremonial law was no longer needed. Now, in this case, we know in the book of Leviticus, this is what God says to the Jewish people. I am the Lord your God. We know capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Who is that? Yahweh, the God of promise and the God of power, right? God who has separated, has separated you from the peoples of the land. Now, he makes this clear to him. And after he says this, there's a gap in there. I just want you to know. He starts to talk about all the animals that they are not to touch or to eat. I, I can't remember it all, cloves, no cloves, whatever else. But you know, some of these animals were animals that people worshipped. And he says, you won't touch them, you're not going to eat them. I want for people to see you're different. Some of these animals were used in worship and people ate them. And he says, I don't want you to touch them, I don't want you to go near them. I want for people to see that you're different from them. Some of these animals, like vultures and, 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 and crabs and lobsters and shellfish, you know what they do? They eat they're scavengers. They eat the garbage off the land, things that are decaying. And God says, you were not redeemed with corruptible things. I don't want you to take that in. You see, he was showing his people that you can show that you're my people by being different from the people who are in this land. In fact, he goes on to say here, you shall therefore distinguish between clean animals and unclean, look at this, to show you are mine. Let me ask you a question. What do you need to do today to show that you're Jesus's? Jesus says, they will know your mind by your love for one another. 
His Holy Spirit now dwells in us. Amen? And he says to Peter, go ahead. You can eat these things. He's giving a whole new revelation to Peter. He's not violating the law. He's getting rid of the ceremony because Jesus has come. Amen? It's nice to have a ceremony for someone, but I'd rather have them. How about you? You can have a big roast all night, but when the man of the hour comes up, everyone claps. There's such love in that room for that person. And guess what? We don't have to worry about the ceremony anymore because Jesus Christ, the person, is with us. Amen? The Redeemer and the Reconciler. So you can change that, Drew. As God gives them this revelation, Peter, does anyone know what his reaction is? Right? Look what it says here. It says, but Peter said, by no means, Lord. Now think about what he's saying. No, God. I wouldn't want to be him, amen? No, God. For I have never eaten anything unholy or unclean. Peter's always kept the dietary law and and, and he's, he's maintained it. And then another voice came from heaven again and said, what God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. Now, he's not talking about the animals and the food right now. He's talking about the people who eat them. You see, God has called us to live a holy life. And I pray that you live a holy life. And there are those in the world that don't know Christ and they don't live a holy life. But listen, what might happen is because we, we, we walk a certain way and we have a certain uh, morality about us that we'll look at people who don't have it and we'll say, Pfft. and you know what he says? Peter, I want to cleanse them. Peter, I want to save their souls. And for the people I want to declare righteous through the word of God, don't you dare let food get in the way. Man, is that a message for me? Because food gets in the way of everything for me. I'm just telling you right now. Right? He needs to humble himself. He has these convictions within him that this is the only way God's going to work. This is the only way God's going to move. And this is the only way that I can please God. But Peter understands, has to understand something. He's not righteous because of the way he lives. He's righteous because of what Christ did for him. Amen? God, he has to humble himself before God and let him, God teach him something. You can change that slide. But you know, when God speaks to us in a way, and this, this was monumental, because till now, all the people that were in the early church were Jewish people. There were no, there were no non-Jewish people there. Anyone here Jewish? We might have one or two. Anyone have a little Jewish blood in you, maybe? Anyone do the, uh, the old, all oh, right, terrific. Um, and Colleen, right? So you did the uh, 23andMe kind of thing, you know, all that stuff, right? But, but, but look, the, the first, the gospel was to the Jew, and it, it was among the Jews. In fact, uh, just a few years after Jesus, it's estimated that one-third of the church in Jerusalem were now, uh, excuse me, of the synagogues in Jerusalem were worshiping Jesus. Is that amazing? But now, all of a sudden, he wants for Peter, we're going to see in a minute, to talk to someone who's not even a Jewish person. This person's never kept the law. He's made no covenants with God. He doesn't have the sign of the circumcision. He's got nothing. And he says, I want you to tell him about Jesus. You know how, like to the Jew, that's... Right? So, when God speaks something monumental like this... It's always good to get a little confirmation, isn't it? In fact, it said, when we saw the previous slide, the previous verse, uh, verse 16, it says that God showed Peter this vision three times. First time, ha, must have been the pepperoni pizza last night. Right? Or should I say the falafel? I don't know. Second time, hmm. Third time, God, you've spoken to me. This is no mistake. But then look what happens. It says, um, while Peter was greatly perplexed in his mind, he didn't fully understand what God was doing. And you know, when God speaks to you, sometimes you may not understand it at first. It's okay. Ask God for wisdom. Amen? 
It says, uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> the men who had been sent by Cornelius arrived. Just as he's questioning what this vision was all about, these, 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 they're probably Roman soldiers under his, under his uh, he has 100 men under him. He's probably sent three of his soldiers over. And guess what? God is now going to confirm what was said because he didn't only speak to Peter, he spoke to Cornelius too, right? That's how God confirms things. I, I, I think God wants to do it. It seems a little crazy to me. You know, I feel like God's been working on my heart the same way. Wow, God's been working on my heart the same way. Maybe God's confirming something among us. Amen? And so what happens is, this is so cool. Uh, Peter's reflecting on the vision. And the Spirit says to Peter, Behold, three men are looking for you. They were sent by Cornelius, right? But get up, go downstairs, and accompany them. Say that with me. Without misgivings. Without misgivings. What's a misgivings? I know, that's the wife of Mr. Givings, right? I'm just joking, <laughs> right? Misgivings, that means without hesitation. Have you ever feel you're doing something for the Lord, but you had hesitation? You know, I, I just, maybe if it's something outside the box. I've had a lot of hesitation over the past few months. Going online, not having services here doing something in a drive and us all wearing masks. There's a lot of hesitations. But then the Lord relieved me of all this to say, no, Matt, let me move among you. It makes no difference if you're wearing a mask or not. You can worship me. So we've got to stay a few feet apart. We love to be together. That won't be forever. But you know something? We hesitate because we don't want to offend God. But when we know the difference between the secular and the, uh, and the sacred, we can work through that. God is not offended by people coming together at any time and in any way and worshiping Him. Amen? So what happens is, you can turn that back just for a moment, Drew. So what happens is, He goes, go without hesitation, accompany them, right? For I have sent them. Now you can change it, thank you. <laughs> God confirms it. See, if we're going to be people of prayer on a regular basis, coming to Him, asking Him to reveal His will and His direction and His strength and His power to us, He will. And when He speaks, He'll always confirm it through the Word and He'll confirm it through others around us. Amen? And then the next thing that we see, and I'll say this, is uh, actually go back one slide, Drew. Um, no. Go forward. Okay, there you are. Okay. We need to be humble. We need to be humble. Remember, he says, by no means, Lord, have I ever eaten anything unholy. See, Peter is so caught up in his own convictions right now, right? And he's being right. He's not even listening to God. Now, he hears him, but he's not listening to him. You see, he needs to humble himself right now. He needs to humble himself before God. All right, you can change that slide, Drew. God confirms it, and then to be teachable, I apologize. So, look what he says. Uh, what happens is he goes with these three guys, and he goes to the house of Cornelius. And Cornelius tells him the whole story about how Cornelius was praying and, and asking God to reveal something to him, and he was fasting, and how God said, Cornelius, your prayers and your alms have come before me, and, 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 and I'm going to answer that question. And there's a guy named Peter that, that's going to be at the Tanner's house, and I want you to go and get him and bring him to you because he has something he needs to share from you that's from me. And Cornelius is obedient, and he sends the men, and he brings Peter back, and Peter goes, boink, that's amazing. Look what he says, you yourselves know... This this is Peter talking to Cornelius, how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit with him. In other words, Jew didn't go into Gentiles' homes because they were unclean, right? And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. See, Peter's beginning to realize he's, be, he's becoming teachable in his heart and his mind that God wants to reach more than the Jewish people right now. He wants to reach the Gentile people too. Are there some people in your mind that are unreachable? Are there some people in your mind who uh, they don't deserve the gospel for the way they act, the way they are? They are the biggest candidates for the gospel. God can transform any heart of any person. Sometimes we're afraid to share the gospel because they might reject it. We're afraid to share the gospel because they may say or do something uh, to us. But listen to me, without the gospel, they will not be saved. 
That is why I came without even raising any, any objection. That's what that dream was all about. So I ask for what reason you have sent for me. Opening, and, and then Cornelius tells him, and Peter opens his mouth and says, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears God and does what is right is welcome to him. Guys, I want to remind you of something. This is Jesus' words. The harvest, say it with me, is what? Plentiful. The labors are? Now, sometimes I look at the news, and I go out in the world out there, and I say, does anyone care about God? Isn't that what Elijah did? And God had to bring him to school, too. Listen to Jesus' words. The harvest is plentiful. There's a reason why people are angry. There's a reason they're lost. And listen to me, you have the answer. And if you're afraid to give them the answer, they will never know. Amen? They will never know. And Peter, he's teachable. He says, wow, that's amazing. God, I didn't get it. I thought this was just a Jewish thing. I just thought, was there your Jewish people? But Lord, you want to fulfill the promises of Abraham to all the world. Remember what he says, Abraham, I'll bless you. And in you, Abraham, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Oh, oh, we can change that slide. We need to be people of prayer on a regular basis. We need to ask God to reveal to us what he's doing, what he wants us to do. We need to be humble about our convictions. We need to let God confirm what he speaks to us through others. We need to be teachable about what God wants to do and how he wants to do it through us. And the next thing that's really important here, we have to know we need to share the gospel, not just love. Now, please understand uh, what I'm saying. And there's, there's, how many people know we need to love people? And we emphasize that all the time. But don't trade the gospel for love. Bring the gospel through love. You want to hear what I'm saying right now? Now, look at the Bible's an amazing book. And man, I know we teach it here at Mountaintop. We've taught Old Testament, we've taught New Testament, and we need to. But the, even the Bible must be taught with the gospel. The whole of the Bible points to the gospel. The whole of the Bible shows the need of man and God's desire to redeem him. Yet, Jesus is the pinnacle. You see, give a plate of cookies. Let them know God loves them. But somewhere in there, in your relationship, wherever it might fit, make sure you share Christ gave his life for you. Christ took your punishment and mine. He took mine on the cross, and I've been forgiven, and I've been set free, and I have life eternal. I no longer have to worry about my present or my future because I know I'm in his hands. See, if you never share the gospel of Christ, the love of Christ without the gospel of Christ will never give them the secret to being set free. And this guy loves, the centurion loves God. He loves the people, but he doesn't know Jesus. And you know something? For all his goodness, until he knows Christ, nothing's going to change in his life. Yet he sends Peter to do it. And I'm sure Peter's like this. I, 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 I don't want to do this. I've never eaten viper before. <laughs> right? I, I don't, I mean, oh my gosh, I'm going to be eating pork chops tonight. Ah! Yet God's going to use it. While Peter was still speaking, he shared, if I, I, there's a very large portion uh, in, in Acts chapter 9. I encourage you to sit down and read his message. It's it take you about two minutes to go through it. But it all centers on this Jesus Christ who came, who died, who took upon himself our sin, and is the redeemer of the world. And it says, as he spoke these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. Now, if the Holy Spirit fell upon them, what happened to them? They got saved. They received Christ. Because how many people know you don't receive the Holy Spirit until you've received Christ? Amen? 
This is sort of neat because God's going to confirm this right now because that means that they're, they've been given the Holy Spirit. I, I believe this what's starting to happen in that room is what happened in the second chapter of Acts. Some of them are starting to speak in tongues and others are starting to prophesy. You're seeing a change in their lives and people are, their lives are being completely changed and God is showing something to Peter. I want to save these people. Who are these people? It's Cornelius, probably his wife and his kids, but you know who else it is? If it's the house of Cornelius, it's all the servants of Cornelius. I am sure he's got all of his soldiers there right now in a form. Maybe he's got a hundred soldiers there listening to Peter preach this message right now. And it says all that were there gave their heart to Christ. If you were a Jew and they had just crucified Jesus a few months earlier, would you really want to tell a Roman about Jesus Christ? What did the Romans do just a few months earlier? They crucified him. And what were they doing? They were looking for his followers and rounding up and putting him in prison. And think about this. Peter goes out and tells the centurion and all his people. And look at this. All the circumcised believers who came, that means Jewish believers, right, came with Peter, were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they were all hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Now you got to hear this. this is very important. Jesus wants to save everybody. Amen? There's no one excluded from that. And he's calling us to go out and share that message. And maybe we've been doing things one way and there's nothing wrong with what we've done. It's how God was moving that way in the past. But you know, I believe that we are on the precipice of doing things very, very differently. I don't know what the future holds. I believe the birth pangs are getting greater. I believe that Christ's second coming is on the cusp and I'm looking forward to that. But it might mean that the church is going to be doing things very differently than we've ever done them before. And we've got to be open to what God wants to do in the church and what he wants to do in our own personal lives to share Jesus Christ with others. We've got to separate the secular from the sacred and realize there are people who need to hear the word and the message of Jesus Christ. We have to be those who know who we are, know whose we are, so that we can share with the world without falling into the world. Amen? We need to be those who pray on a regular basis to receive the, the, the power of God and the will of God. We need to be those who, who ask God for his revelation in our lives, are willing to be a blessing for other people. We've got to be those who are humble within ourselves, thinking we know it all, and say, God, there are things you want to do. We've got to be teachable. We've got to make sure that we're not just loving people, but we're sharing the gospel with the love that we love them with. And as we close today, the last thing, for those we share Christ with, we need to help them walk in obedience. In fact, I got a surprise for somebody today. I'll be talking to them afterwards. Look what happens. Peter answers, surely no one can refuse water for those to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit, just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Wow. You know what happened? Let's, let's move them forward. Let's move them forward. Let's, let's, let's help them to be obedient before God. Let's, let's disciple them. Let's mentor them. These people who now have given their hearts to Christ, let's help them move forward. Who do you know who might be a young Christian who may need your help? Now, don't say the pastor will do it. Now, I'll always do it. Don't take me wrong. But you know, it's funny. We have over 350 people on and off who come to Mountaintop Church. And there are people who maybe on a weekly basis could use a mentor in their life. I can fit maybe four or five people a week and do that. But listen to me, without you, there are a lot of people who will never grow in Christ. They'll never have someone who takes interest in their lives. See, he's calling all of us to be that friend who will mentor others and push other people forward in Christ. I'm not saying that to make anyone feel guilty today. It's hard for all of us, including myself, to get out of our box, amen? But would you consider today who God may be laying upon your heart to invest some time and some love in order to speak into their life and see them grow in Jesus Christ. I saw one of the young people who were coming to the church before the, the, uh, before the uh, pandemic struck. Very excited about the church and I've called him a couple times and he's been happy to hear from us and we saw him in the mall the other day, Diane and I. And I said, wow, it's so nice to see you. I'd like to get together with you. He lit up. Young man, 20 years old, pastor, that would be wonderful. There are people who would love for you to spend time with them and encourage them in Christ. Amen? I want to encourage you right now. I want to make this real. Between now and September, 
we've decided to put the Bible study on hold. What I've decided to do is I've decided to meet with a few people and spend some time with some young people that I want to see grow right now. Would you consider Wednesday nights, if you were coming to the Bible study, to say, you know, for these next four or five or six Wednesday nights, I'm going to get together with another family from the church. I'm going to get together with someone who needs to grow in Christ or maybe doesn't know Christ. And I'm going to spend that night reaching out to somebody and blessing them. Would you take that challenge with me? Would you take one night a week to say, I'm going to get together? Hey, guys, it's great. I, I love going up to the tent of the Bud Lake Diner. Adam does wonderful. It's like a big circus over there. How many people know that? Hey, Enzo's, there's some great umbrellas up over there. There are places you can go. Hey, just go in your back deck. If you got a deck, cook hamburgers for them. But look, God is calling us now. He's calling us in this last call. There are people he wants to save and he wants to use us. And I believe he has a mission for every single person here that maybe you're not even in touch with yet. Father, I ask that you'd help us right now, Lord. As we pray, Lord, on a regular basis, Lord, that you'd speak and reveal yourself to us, your heart to us, Lord, for those that are lost. Lord, that you'd lay upon our hearts, Lord, those that you want us to reach, Lord, without hesitation, Lord God. Lord, that our convictions would not get in the way, Lord God, of our witness. Oh, Jesus, it's my prayer, Lord God, we'd be humble and teachable before you, Lord, for what you want to do, Lord, that we would share what you did in our lives, Lord Jesus. Oh, Jesus, right now I do pray, Lord, that, that you would use us in such a special way, Lord, to share the gospel with the love of God, Lord Jesus. Not to be ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Oh, Lord, there are people in our midst that we work with, people in our midst that we live among, Lord, people we live with, Lord, neighbors around us, people from school, Lord, people in our community, they don't have a clue, Lord God. And if we truly love them, Lord God, we will share the message of Jesus Christ with them. Lord, in this late day before you come again, move upon our hearts, move upon our souls, move our mouths that we would share this liberating message of Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, we know you're coming soon and we ask you to use us, your church. We ask it in Christ's name.